Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we might just give it a couple more minutes just whilst there's a few more people jumping on. So we've got a few already, which is which is great. Um, but just give us a, a minute or two and then we'll we'll get started. See James left a message. I was just talking about. Uh, unfortunately, there is one less person on this webinar. It was Dylan Thomas from from Milk Chocolate, but he went down with glandular fever on Monday, so he's he's out of action. But um, thanks, James. I'll pass that message on. He's not uh, he's not feeling too crash hot. Um, I think we might get started, guys. We've got uh, we've got a few people on already. Um, so it's, it's just one minute past the start time. So um, we'll, we'll get started. So welcome, everybody. My name is Richie, and I'm the co-founder of Milk Chocolate, and thanks for joining us today. I'm joined by Ben Wong from Odin Mortgage and also Brad Murphy and Darren Catherell from UKAU Tax Advisors. Um, so today, guys, we're aiming to guide you through everything you need to know from the expat mortgage process to navigating Australian taxes and securing your dream property. Um, specifically, we'll provide guidance on property investment and taxation for Australians living overseas. And topics will include tips to maximise borrowing power for the Australian, for Australian property, information to help secure the best financial deals for Aussie expats in the UK, recent changes in Australian property markets uh, and its impacts on Australian expats, exclusive data and insights on Australia's outperforming state for investment purposes, and what is the game plan for expats prior to purchasing property abroad. So that's what we'll try and get through. Um, there is three um, sections today, so we'll try to keep it to about 15 minutes each um, and leaving some time uh, for Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions, guys, just pop them into the into the little Q&A um, bar down below and we'll get to those. Um, but as always, the standard disclaimer, uh, is that any advice is advice of a general nature today and you must just consult your own professional services provider before making any decisions. So, guys, without further ado, um, first up is going to be Ben from Odin Mortgage and then that will be followed by Brad and Darren from UK AU Tax Advisors and then I'll be going solo today without Dylan um, uh, from Milk Chocolate talking about the Australian property market and also about game plans as well. So I might hand over to, to Ben um, to take it from here and um, and then we'll move on to, to Brad and Darren thereafter. Are you all good, Ben, to, to share your screen? Yeah, um, is that visible? Yes, great, yeah. Yep, yep, new slide, okay. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, guys. Um, welcome to the Buying Australian Property from the UK webinar, where we're going to share some essential information for UK-based uh, the expats and overseas residents. So I will be going over the um, uh, the general Australian lending overview, as well as, as quite a few of the stats I would like to share. Um, but before that, I'd like to do a quick snapshot um, for you guys on Aussie expats in the UK. Um, so... There's currently close to 27 million uh, population in Australia now, with a million of that um, overseas. There's a million Aussies uh, living all around the globe here. But in the UK alone, uh, based on the Office of National Statistics from the UK in 2021, there's around 165,000 Australian-born residents in the UK. And from our data, we were able to ascertain that um, from a mortgage perspective, okay, that 40% um, of our clients from the UK, uh, they were looking to purchase their dream home back in Australia. So obviously you move overseas, work um, uh, several years in the UK, and the idea is always to come back to Australia at some point, um, and they would like to buy their dream home. Uh, the other 40% would like to continue um, acquiring properties for wealth, um, I guess, growing their wealth uh, and um, Aussies have a love affair with Australian properties as, you know, over the, over the past few decades, it's just been going up year on year. So 
we have a lot of clients who also want to continue growing uh, their, their investment prof portfolio through um, properties. And then the, the remaining last 20%, uh, we find that they're looking to refinance the existing mortgages that they already have in Australia uh, for two purposes. Obviously, to just save money, to get on a lower interest rate, or to access equity cash out so that they can go ahead and purchase um, uh, uh, one of the properties, uh, whether that be in the UK or in Australia. So I want to go over what's still possible um, in terms of lending in Australia. So you can borrow up to 80% um, generally, uh, but there is still one bank that will lend you up to over 80%. So in Australia, you can gen generally borrow up to 95% with lenders mortgage insurance, but now that you're living overseas in the UK, uh, that's not quite the case anymore. 80% is the maximum. And there's only one bank, Commonwealth Bank, that will go up to 90% with lenders mortgage insurance. That's a fee that you have to pay in order to borrow an extra 10%. You can um, do equity cash out. What I mean by this one is if you have an existing property in Australia, we can top up the loan back up again, you know, from 60% back up to 80%, get out that extra 20% of equity. We can still do that. And we can get loan terms up to 30 years, regardless of your age. So it could be 90 years old, which is to get you a 30 year loan term, um, assuming you have con a regular cash flow. And unlike countries like uh, Singapore um, or Hong Kong, there's no early repayment penalties uh, by law. So if we got you a mortgage today, you could effectively pay it out tomorrow and they won't charge you like the one, 2% early repayment penalty. Um, so it's good. Uh, it keeps the banks honest and in the sense that you're not stuck with that bank. So if they decided to increase rates relative to all of the other banks, you could always look to refinance and there'll be no fees holding you back. So all of the banks in Australia are quite competitive amongst each other. So in 2024, there's actually not too much happening uh, for people you know, living in the UK uh, from, from a lending perspective. The, the rates are still high. Um, um, so as we know, the Central Bank of Australia have increased rates all throughout 2023. But over the last several months, there hasn't been any increases. So here yeah, I put in that the assessment rate is still at 9.45%. So that's that's the interest rate that the banks use when they're trying to calculate how much you can borrow. So actually interest rates in Australia right now for mortgages is around 6.4%, I would say. Um, but the banks add on an additional 3% when they try to calculate how much you can borrow. Uh, they do that to be conservative, to ensure that if there's any future rate increases, you'll still be able to afford your mortgage. Um, aside from that, uh, the, the interest rates are at a local high, um, and we've been plateaued for the last several months. Um, potentially some opportunities here where the, um, our buzz agents who are going to be talking, uh, uh, later on milk chocolate, uh, they can present some opportunities here because with the rates, um, at the local high, um, it's, it is, um, sort of pricing out some, some would be buyers. Okay, so in effect, uh, there may be some opportunities there in order to go in and uh, grab uh, some properties at, at a pretty good price, as well as some people trying to pay off, off the um, sell the property uh, for because the repayments are quite high at this moment. Investor housing interest rates is what I want to talk about next. So uh, interest rates is always a, a hot topic for mortgages, and I wanted to show you what the the trend looks like and what um people are paying on at the moment for fixed rates higher beginning twenty twenty two, so during the pandemic, the the majority of our clients opted to fix their interest rates because fixed rates were down here at around two percent. You know, at the start of this uh, chart here, um, super low, and you can see the fixed rates were below the variable rate. So everyone just fixed their interest rates. That was the advice, and the majority of people did that. But now in twenty twenty four, all of the fixed rates pretty much have ended now. So um, we find that the vast majority of people now are on variable rate rates. So the average variable rate for people at the moment uh, who has a mortgage is around 6.53%. So if you are at 6.53% or higher, I recommend you guys coming up and chatting with us um, and we can get you rates um, from 6.29%. Generally it's around 6.34, 6.39, but we can get rates from around 6.29% at this moment. So 95% of our clients at the moment are opting for variable rates. So when you get a mortgage in Australia, you can choose between variable rates. That's the floating rate. That's the rate that goes up and down, depending on what the central banks um, do with the cash rate. 
or you can choose to fix your rates and you can fix your rates up to five years, like one, two, three, four, five years, you could fix it for. Uh, but at this moment, the vast majority are choosing to go variable. Um, and they're doing that because uh, the consensus was for the last several months that rates was going to start to get cut at the beginning, the beginning of next year. So people wanted to go on the floating rate. So when the central bank cuts rates, you know, their rates would come down with it. How about share some stats showing that uh, where it might be on a higher rate for longer uh, here. So this is just the cash rate, the the interest rate that's set by the central bank of Australia. Um, they in, The last time they increased it was back in November, 2023, and they increased it to 4.35%. There's been no change since. But because of uh, the sticky inflation rate um, in the latest month's data, um, it looks like rates will look like to stay higher for longer. They, the RBA, the Central Bank of Australia, um, has uh, stated that they're not ruling anything out and potentially uh, further rate increases um, might happen to keep inflation under control. So with this inflation rate, um, Australia is obsessed with trying to keep the inflation target at 2 to 3%. And on the left-hand side here, you can just see, you know, it was 3.4%. And then it crept up 3.5, 3.6. And then the latest one was four. Um, and because of that, the uh, this chart here kind of just shows you the prediction market sort of of um, what people in the market are thinking at this moment. So this line here is the six, the 4.35% cash rate set by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, they're thinking potentially there might be a rate increase by the end of this year um, uh, before getting cut you know, a few times uh, later, 2025. Uh, people ask me about rates all the time, whether they're going to go up or down. So it's really hard to say, um, okay, because if I went back to this in January, uh, when inflation was under control, the prediction here was all under this blue line, you know, so it really is driven by uh, inflation rate. Um, if it's up, it's down, then that's kind of predicts you whether our rates will go up or down. But that changes month to month, quarter and quarter. So it's really hard to say. Uh, next up, I wanted to talk about what are the variables that the banks look at when they're thinking about lending you money as an Aussie or foreigner living and working in the UK. So really, they're looking at just two main things. All right. So the first one is how much deposit you have. And the second one is uh, your income um, uh, after expenses. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on what I mean. So I think it's quite intuitive, but um, uh, when they're looking at deposit, it can it's generally any liquid assets that you have. So it could be bank savings. Your shares also count towards your deposit as well. You don't actually even have to liquidate or sell your stocks um, from your brokerage. You just need to show your share portfolio account showing that you have those liquid assets. Uh, if you don't have money, you can also grab get uh, money gifted to you from your from your parents or relatives. Again, they don't have to actually send you the money to your bank account. They just have to write a letter saying that they're happy to lend let you or not lend you, give you a gift of cash sum, and that would be okay. The the last thing that you could um, whereby you would get money from is um, from cashing out from your property uh, in the form of equity. But aside from that, actually, there's other things you can do as well. Again, like perhaps getting a personal loan in the UK, that can all help supplement your deposit. So with equity from your property, um, kind of want to talk about this. So if you were to buy a property in Australia for $1 million, uh, we could borrow up to 80%. So that's $800,000, that's a loan. Uh, and then you would have to add on some miscellaneous fees, but primarily the biggest fee uh, that you would have to pay to acquire property is the stamp duty, the government stamp duty. Usually that's around 5% of the purchase price. So I put in 50,000. So in this instance here, you would need around $250,000. And the bank just want to see that when you add up all of this stuff here, it'll be around $250,000. And if you can do that, then that uh, gives you the green tick. So um, before I go into equity, I want to talk a little bit about income. So uh, so with income, this would be the mainly the the, the thing that catches off uh, most expats in in the UK or around the world. So when we're trying to get you guys a mortgage, right? Um, this one was generally the hardest one to prove uh, because the Australian banks they don't fully understand British pound income, um, commissions, allowances, bonuses, or even stock units. So some of you are working for bigger companies or tech companies, whereby 
you get best best in stock units. A lot of the banks in Australia just will not lend to you. So in Australia, there's over 40 banks and lenders. But as soon as you're living overseas in the UK, we're looking at less than 10 banks, I would say. Um, and out of those 10, they will treat these income differently. Uh, when I say differently, I mean by uh, the discounting. So they would discount um, commissions by 20%. They would discount allowances and bonuses, uh, allowances by 20%, bonuses by um, uh, 36%, and then stock units by 36% as well. So they discount all of your income before putting it into the stress test. The reason why they do all of this discounting against your British pound income is because of the currency um, exchange fluctuation against the Australian dollar. Because you're buying a property uh, in Australian dollars, you're getting a mortgage in Australian dollars, and but you're getting paid in British pounds, right? So they the banks again are very conservative. They want to make sure that if the Australian dollar appreciates heavily against the British pounds, that you'll still be able to service your loan. Hence why they do all of that discounting. They do additional discounting on the variable type of income because it's volatile. Like your bonuses, you might get it this year, you might not get it next year. Um, same thing with the stock units. That's the reason. So Income is one of the more trickier things to prove to the lender. Um, but once we prove that, then that's generally what, um, you know, will give you the green tick there. The other type of income that we can use is your rental income from investment properties. Mainly these are just uh, properties in Australia. So if you have uh, rental income in, in, in London um, or the UK, we can also use that too, but a lot of banks uh, won't want us to use that. Uh, but they will let us use all of your Australian investment property rental income and even a property that you intend to buy. So you want to buy a property, but it hasn't settled yet. They will let us use the future rental income of that property in the assessment. So coming back to the equity component, like when I was talking about deposit, how you can get equity uh, to be part of that deposit. This is a little example here. Let's say you have a property in 2018 that you bought for $600,000. Um, and you had you took out an 80% mortgage on that. Uh, fast forward to 2024, um, you know your, the property has increased its value to 800,000 and you, and you pay down your mortgage to 400,000. So now the loan to value ratio is only 50%. So we can actually increase that loan to value ratio back up to 80% and get you in a, you know an additional 240,000 in equity there. So in my example, right, where I was talking about how you needed 250,000, um, if you had a property in Australia, uh, in Australia and we could technically get equity out and, and supplement this to the point where you would only need to come up with uh, $10,000 of your own cash. So this is um, generally how a lot of property investors grow their uh, property portfolio. They'll just keep rolling over and re-leveraging to keep buying that next property. Obviously, it works extremely well in, 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 in boom markets uh, where your property prices are going up, but it, it could work against you in, in a bear market. Um, so yeah, this little example here, you would only need 10,000. I want to talk about timeline here to give you guys an idea of what that process would look like in terms of, from a mortgage perspective. So usually when you're trying to buy a property, uh, the first step is to understand how much you can borrow because that would determine how much you can actually buy for, you know, before you actually go shopping and putting down offers on $2 million properties. And if you could only borrow 1 million, um, and you don't even have a million dollars in cash, then you know, uh, you shouldn't be putting down offers. So the first step is um, to try to understand exactly how much you can borrow. So through our company at Odin Mortgage, <clears throat> we have a quick online form. It will take five minutes to complete. And we only ask questions that are required in order to give you the, the most accurate assessment. So we're not going to ask for stuff like driver's license number and things like that. So once you have filled out a form, um, we will give you an assessment within 48 hours. Um, and then you'll take a week to review your lender options, um, the loan structure, and so forth. Once you have decided on the lender, that's when we will send you an online document portal personalized to you, um, whereby you then drag and drop pay slips, passports, so forth. And then we would um, prepare all the paperwork for you to um, sign and we'll submit the application. So when we submit the application, it takes around two to three weeks. Here I put two to four weeks to get the loan um, approved. Okay, so if you're actually living and working in Australia, it only takes around four working days to get the loan pre-approved. Um, but because you're overseas, um, there's not a lot of bank assessors that are familiar with assessing British pounds income. So mm, we're sort of kind of bottlenecked by that. So it's just a lot of waiting time, two to four weeks. 
but I know it's a lot faster than the UK mortgage process. And so after two to four weeks, you know, we have the letter from the bank saying, hey, congratulations, um, your loan is approved for $1 million, for example. And the pre-approval letter will last for up to six months. So it's three months initially, and then we can extend it for a further three months for a total of six months. But that's six months for you to start putting down offers on properties, which I believe is plenty of time. Yep. Um, and then that's when you can start beginning your property journey with a buyer's agent and they'll help you research uh, properties and you can start putting down offers on, on properties. And then you can, once you find the property that you like, you would sign the contract, uh, the property contract, the contract of sale. And then that's when you would provide that contract of sale back to the, us, the mortgage brokers. And we will send that to the bank uh, to order a valuation to you know, uh, ensure that the property is, um, it's, you know, has walls, it's standing. They, they need to do a valuation to ensure that uh, because the banks are taking security over that property. Uh, and then usually the um, the settlement um, uh, is, is between 30 to 60 days uh, to settle, but it won't take 30 to 60 days. Like once you've done this entire process at the front end, <clears throat> we could get the loan formally approved the loan contract within a week after your contractor sales. So it's really just a lot of waiting time afterwards. Um, um, yeah. So that's when it was settled um, and all of the money changes hands and you just get the keys to the, to the house. I, um, that's just, uh, so before I pass it over to the next speaker, I, was, I wanted to drop this chart here to show you how, what's the difference between us or the mortgage versus other mortgage brokers and banks. I didn't want to go through all of these things. So I'll just uh, leave this slide here because the slides will be shared and you will have a look at um, to, to see how we differentiate. But essentially, uh, at Oda Mortgage, uh, we've helped over 2,000 experts already globally, um, over 40 different countries. Uh, we're just highly focused in this niche. And we don't charge a fee for service either. So the banks pay us, they all pay the same. So we're just trying to take you to the best bank uh, that's uh, relevant for your unique situation. Um, and aside from that, our company's uh, mission is just to make the entire mortgage process start to end as effortless as possible uh, for people living overseas. So that's it for me. Um, I'll pass over to um, the tax account. It's UK uh, AU tax, Brad and Darren. Yes. So you guys can help uh, share your screen. And I think that would pick up on mine. Thanks, Ben. Right. Just um, just while the guys are doing that, there was just one question yeah. that came through. Might be worthwhile ask, answering this now. And it was, um, can yeah. Australian lenders take into account equity from properties owned in other countries, i.e. UK or Europe? Yeah, they can. So if you had a mortgage, uh, a property and mortgage in the UK, you can take out equity from there. But um, the Australian banks will not take... Uh, will not be able to go through an Australian bank. You would have to go through you know, your UK mortgage brokers or UK banks to get up the equity first. And then once you have the equity, we can show the Australian banks that you have money sitting in your bank account because that's the equity that you put out from the UK property. And that could be used towards the, uh, uh, the Australian property acquisition. One thing I'll add there, and um, uh, the tax guys here can, can, can uh, provide context is, I believe if you took out equity from your UK property and the interest that you pay on that UK, equity loan can be used as a deduction against your um, Australian tax return. That's definitely right, Ben, and probably a good intro to our deck, but that's certainly yeah. right. If you have uh, losses from a UK property, you can deduct those expenses and interest um, on the Australian return. So negative gearing does apply um, equally in Australia. If you're living in Australia with a UK property making a loss, which um, can certainly be helpful. But um, maybe we'll come to that in a bit more detail in, in a second. But just quickly, a bit about us. Um, yeah, we're an Australian international tax firm based in, in Melbourne and Sydney. We actually recently just opened up our UK office. So yeah, so myself and Darren are yeah, dual qualified Australian and UK advisors. And yeah, our real sort of focus is international tax planning, doing returns for expats, um, in particular, the Australian and UK markets. 
Uh, just quickly, what we'll cover today, um, obviously the focus is really regarding Australian property um, in Australia and the UK um, as it relates to expats living in both countries. But we'll cover um, the Australian main residence um, issues, uh, investment property planning for investment properties, look at some negative gearing as it relates to uh, the UK and Australia, and then we'll have a look at what it means to, to come to Australia if you've got a UK property. Uh, just quickly, if you look at the two tax systems, Australia and the UK, it's really important to consider both systems um, together and in an integrated fashion. You know, what might be tax efficient in Australia is not always efficient in the UK and, and vice versa. I mean, there is certainly a system of you know, foreign tax credits to alleviate double tax in most circumstances, but it's really important to consider you know, your time frame in the UK or Australia and where it makes sense to hold property um, in, in each country. So first, we'll just quickly touch on tax residency because this does drive a lot of um, outcomes on the property side. In a nutshell, if you're an Aussie going to the UK, you would normally become a non-resident of Australia if you spend more than two years in the UK. Um, and at the same time, your UK residency date was normally start on the date of arrival into the UK under part year treatment. So the two systems do marry up quite well in that regard. Um, yeah, in contrast, if you're going to the UK for a short-term secondment or an assignment, it's very much possible that you can be a dual resident of both Australia and the UK. And that's where the, the tax treaty comes in to sort of allocate taxing rights. But th th we always recommend the first point um, from a tax planning perspective is be very clear on your tax residency, um, more so normally from Australia, given it can be a bit more gray than, than the UK. But we won't linger on that too much today. So if you look at hey, uh, probably the- yeah, um, so, Sorry, Brad, just yeah. got one request just to put it into presentation mode, if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. Let me see if I can actually do that. If not, that's okay, because we're going to share the slides yeah. after, after okay, the webinar. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to... Um, hi, How's Brad, that? I that... think you... Yeah. Is that... Got it. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 perfect. Perfect. Thanks, mate. No worries. Uh, all good. Yeah, so if we look at, I think, the probably the biggest issue we see in practice on a day-to-day -day basis with Aussies going to the UK, um, or Aussies going to any country, um, is when they effectively have an Australian home and they move overseas, just be aware that your Australian main residence um, does not qualify for the exemption if you sell it from overseas. So really important that to get the main residence exemption, which exempts in full any gain on your Australian property, you need to be an Australian tax resident when you sell that property. So as part of the planning, definitely plan on selling that Australian property when you're back in Australia. Uh, you do have the option you can rent out the property for six years under the six-year rule. So it could be an option to, you know, you live in your main home in Australia, go to the UK for up to six years, rent out the property and come back to Australia and sell it. In that scenario, you'll get the full exemption for that whole six-year period, which is quite handy. You also got the option if you re-reside in the property in that six-year period, you get a further six years after that point. So it, it's very much possible to retain the exemption um, if you do, you know, want to keep the property and, and move to the UK. But just just bear in mind, really important, you sell it from, from back in Australia. On the investment property side, um, just be, be mindful that and the income and expenses on the property need to be reported to the ATO um, every year. Any profits tax at 32.5% on the profit. If it's a if it's a loss, so if the interest exceeds the the rent, you know, which is negative gearing, that's the term most Aussies know, then that loss is still available to offset any future income in Australia, which is good news. So negative gearing can still apply in Australia. I think just be aware there's a, a, a bit of a mismatch here with the UK system, which we'll come to in a second. Um, negative gearing is a bit more restrictive in the UK. We'll, we'll cover that point um, in a moment. It's quite a common issue for. Aussies in the UK with um, investment properties back in Oz. Other points on the investment property is that 
you do lose a 50% discount for the period you're overseas on the property. Uh, land tax rates are normally a bit higher for expats. Uh, consider making some contributions to your super, which are deductible against the rental income if there's a profit to save some tax. And also look at structuring. An Australian family trust can be, can be really helpful if you've got an investment property back in Australia just to alleviate some of those burdens on the, on the rental income, you know, being taxed at quite a higher rate and the loss of the, the discount. So always good to consider uh, what structures might be available. Uh, and then I guess this is the, the key point that does get overlooked a lot as well is if you're a UK resident, just be aware that any Australian income, including rental income and expenses need to be declared as well in the UK. And there's, there's never any double taxation. There's always a tax credit available in the UK for Australian tax paid on rental profits. But I think, as I mentioned before, the key difference is that on negative gearing, so if you've got an Australian investment property, that, um, that interest deduction, you get a full deduction on the interest to offset the, the rent. Um, but in the UK, they just give you a 20% offset instead. So it's a bit more restrictive in the UK. It can be quite common where you have a loss in Australia, but you end up paying tax in the UK. So I think just, just be mindful of that as part of your planning as well. So there's no surprises over there. Um, other point would be that um, any sale of an Australian property also is included in the UK. But of course, there's a credit for Australian taxes paid. If we look at the other way, so if you own a UK property and you're moving to Australia, uh, also very, very important to consider what that means. First really important point, just to be mindful of that you need to file the income and expenses in, in both countries. So don't, don't forget that, it does often get overlooked. Uh, the, the good news is that if you're a temporary resident coming to Australia, so more relevant for, you know, for a British citizen coming to Australia on a temporary visa, you don't include any UK uh, property income in Australia while you're on that temporary visa, which is quite a nice concession. However, if you're an Australian PR or a citizen of Australia, just be mindful that the UK rental income goes in the Australian return, but you get credit for, for what you're paying over, over in the UK. Um, and then also from a capital gains perspective, just look at the, um, the main residence reliefs as well. You, you still can apply the main residence relief to a foreign UK property from Australia, but also just make sure you've got one eye on the UK principal place of residence exemption as well, just to make sure you're ideally trying to get a tax-free outcome on your PPR in both countries. I might now throw it over to Darren to talk about some of the non-DOM changes in the UK. Yeah, thanks, Brad. And um, hi, everyone. Yes, and, you know, keeping the theme on the temporary residence um, note is that, you know, there's been quite a lot of chatter in the UK over the last few months around, you know, what the uh, proposed changes are to the domicile regime. So we thought it would be handy because I know myself when I worked in the in the UK, I took advantage of this system. <laughs> so, you know, first-hand knowledge of, of how it works. And, and, and basically it's uh, a regime where if you're not born in the UK or you haven't done enough to move, you know, your entire life there, then you could take advantage of what they referred to as the remittance basis, which meant holistically you could keep all your Australian income and gains offshore. And as long as you didn't bring them back into the UK, you'd never pay any UK tax to it. Um, you know, there were some automatic rules that that were in play. So if those gains uh, were less than two thousand pounds, you, you didn't have to actually do anything. Um, but you know, if if it was more than that, you had to physically claim the remittance basis in your return. The timelines were the first seven years were essentially free. Then after that, there were they'd ratchet up some charges so that you could use the system. And essentially, it was a mathematical gain. You know how much is the charge versus how much tax would I have to pay? And then you just oscillate between the two at, at will. Um, but the biggest point of using the remittance basis was that, you know, you lost the personal allowance. So effectively, you know, the lower rate banned on 12,000 pounds. So, you know, whatever that turned out to be as a tax cost, that's the, the reality of using the basis. Um, in March, 
Yes, the spring budget came out and the current government, well, might not be current after today, but anyway, they made some changes to the to the basis and they've essentially laid waste to the whole domicile regime now. Um, and they've brought in a new four-year rule. So essentially the new rules say that if you haven't been a resident um, in the UK for a decade, you can come uh, with your hands open and you have a four-year period of exemption where you do not have to tell anyone about your foreign income uh, or gains. Um, it, it is less um, beneficial in terms of time. The remittance basis did, did carry on for 15 years. So there, there is quite a limited time frame. But look, in our view, it could actually be quite beneficial for anyone you know who's listening that's recently moved to the UK with Australian income, um, you know, with a little bit of planning. So um, if you if you've been in the UK for a little bit longer and you're currently using the remittance basis, um, you are allowed to rebase your foreign assets at 5 April 2019 if you're looking at selling any of it. And of course, if you want to bring some of that foreign income and gains into the UK before April next year, then there's a 50% tax rate that the, whole, the UK government have said that you can benefit from. So lots and lots of changes. The elections today, so who knows what the uh, what if the government's replaced? Who know? Who knows? There might be further changes, um, you know, afoot. But uh, we deal with what we've got at the moment, and I guess. One of the bigger points with UK, you know, the differences between the UK and Australian systems is the lovely inheritance tax that's uh, uh, ever present on the UK side. And what does it mean, you know, if you've been uh, living in the UK for long enough, you can become deemed domiciled for UK inheritance tax purposes, which, you know, switches on inheritance tax to your global asset profile. So at the moment, you know, if you're not in um, the deemed inheritance tax regime if you own uk land that's always going to be subject to inheritance tax if you uh flick the switch and become domiciled for iht purposes then it is everything uh comes into the mix so one of the key things to remember is that if you're um, born in the uk you have a uk domicile of birth which is very very difficult to turn off which likely leads to, you know, being subject to inheritance tax. But if you um, are an Aussie and you have moved to the UK, the current system um, gives you the, the 15 out of the 20 years to be deemed domiciled. There are planning opportunities that have been preserved um, by the current government in terms of changing the regime, which um, are a topic all by themselves, which we'd love to take up another hour of everyone's time. But um you know, if you if you are interested in um, looking at some of those inheritance tax planning opportunities, um, because you have been in the UK for a little longer, but before April next year, then please, you know, keep us in mind and reach out. You can um, go in and out. The last point I'll make about that is you can go in and out of the inheritance tax regime by leaving the UK just means that there's a time-based apportionment on what you, so the longer you're out of the country after three, but towards six years, then you slowly, you know, exit the IHT regime, fully exited after after six years. So um, ties in nicely with the, the main residence uh, exemption that Brad was talking about earlier. Perfect. Yeah, great. Th thanks, Darren. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for for today, but yeah, please uh, feel free to reach out if you've got any tax questions to myself or Darren, we can definitely organise a consult with you. And I think we'll throw it over to to Richie now. From, yeah, uh, no worries. With chocolate. There is a, there is a, uh, there's a couple of questions in there. Um, do, you want, do you want to just take those now and then I can get cracking after that? Might be easier whilst we're yeah. talking tax. Sounds um, good. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Richie. Yeah, the first one is, so does inheritance tax apply to all nationalities? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good, good, good. Non it, yeah it... <laughs> non discriminatory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. I think the key um, one is just to watch out for if you're moving, if you're from, not from the UK, but you move there and you've been in the UK for 15 out of 20 years, then you're, you're deemed domiciled for UK inheritance tax purposes, which is quite a nasty rule that does catch foreigners going into the UK. Okay. 
Yeah. Beautiful. And also uh, includes another. Sorry, just got around that very quickly. The Nazi bit with that, it also includes any um, global assets. So if you're living in the UK under that rule and you've got, say, Australian property or uh, Australian business or whatever, it's also caught up in that rule. Okay. Yep. Beautiful. And it looks like there is two more. So any benefit from ceasing to be a British, British citizen or is it just birth that ties you down? Good question. Um, I think, you know, if you leaving the UK, um, it would definitely help show your non-domicile status to the UK. So it would definitely help you escape the UK tax net, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It's actually I mean, it is a Sorry. quite a difficult concept, domiciled at birth. Um, and there are some, you know, layers to, to it. But yeah, essentially, um, if you're born in the UK and your parents were domiciled in the UK when you were born, then um, you're in the net. So Yes, um, there might be some future benefits around renouncing um, British citizenship. Mm. Excellent. Looks like uh, tax is a popular topic. There's a few more. Um, so for Australian citizens who are tax residents of the UK, what are the tax implications of moving the money for deposit from the UK to, to Oz? Yeah, it's a pretty common question. So uh, the transfer of cash is not not taxable uh, normally or reportable in any country. Uh, so normally you're free to you know gift money or transfer money from the UK back to Australia you know, as long as you're actually not resident in Australia and the actual income itself is not a taxable event. Normally you're free to move post tax money to Australia. Yeah, okay. You might just keep on going through. There's a few. Um, can you take Oz Super to sip? Uh, no, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you can't move Australian super into the UK. You can move it the other way from the UK to Australia. Cool. Yep. Uh, someone says Irish passport, uh, Irish passport then um, if living in the UK. And then can a family trust help protect from inheritance tax? Uh, yeah, so I think um, on the Irish passport question yes certainly um would probably help show that you don't have a uk domicile of birth um but yeah it would just depend obviously how much time you spent in the uk after that point uh on the australian oh sorry was that using a trust to shield for my ht good good question probably a good one for darren this one yeah well it depends where the the trust is there are some rules in the in the UK that look through um, the trust regime for IHT purposes. There's a 10 year charge um, depending on the asset profile of that trust. From the Australian point of view, of course, there are some planning opportunities there. So they can't. It swings both ways using the trust. It can be useful, um, but it also um, can it can pose some some questions. Awesome. I think that's it, guys. Nice one. Cheers. Um, I might uh, I might have a uh, have a crack now, guys, and just so thank you for for Ben, uh, Darren, uh, and Brad just taking us through uh, financing and tax, and and now we'll do a little bit of a session on buying property and what that looks like, and also just a little bit of a run around the grounds and having a look at what is actually happening in Australian property at the at the moment. It's always a hot topic um, with all of our clients. Um, firstly, just a little bit about myself. You'll also notice there is another chap on the screen, Dillis Thomas. Um, I just mentioned up front at the top of the uh, webinar that unfortunately he's fallen ill with calendular fever, so he can't join us today. He's our real estate lead. He oversees all of our real estate um, purchases nationally across the country, um, has been in the industry for, for just over 15 years. Um, myself, I'm the co-founder of Milk Chocolate, uh, and I oversee the data and analytics purchasing and construction teams. Personally assisted more than 350 clients to create, implement and execute their property goals and also assisted uh, our clients directly on about 120 property purchases and also have been purchasing property um, since 2006. So it certainly is in my blood and it's, it's essentially all I've done in my adult life, which is quite exciting. Um, a little bit about milk chocolate for those who don't know much about milk chocolate. Um, we don't make chocolate, unfortunately, but what we do offer is a complete offering um, that encompasses research, planning, buying, building, and management. Uh, so essentially, we take care of every aspect of your property journey on your behalf. So we are nationally licensed and purchase properties in all states and territories, excluding the Northern Territory. 
Um, and essentially, when we look at our team, um, as you can see on that slide, uh, the team is composed of, of different facets across those different verticals. So um, we have economists, valuers, qualified property investment advisors, data scientists, real estate agents, project managers, to name a few. Um, and we work with all different types of clients. So from those who are living in Australia and wishing to purchase a new property in their own city or interstate, to Aussie expats, just like the most of you on this particular webinar. And in fact, 75% of our clients to date since 2017 have been Australian expats. So um, primarily based in Hong Kong, Singapore, the UK and the UAE. Um, and they have either been purchasing because they're looking to purchase a family um, home back in Australia when they repatriate uh, or essentially building a portfolio whilst they are living abroad. Um, but one of the, the things that they all have in, in common is their desire to find just a basically a simpler way of purchasing properties um, that is that is removing the mess, um, which is often frustrating uh, and a really complicated experience. And we just make it seamless and easy for them. So um, we firstly, we would start by understanding your lifestyle or financial drivers um, to firstly help inform what your bespoke strategy is and whether that's a single investment a family home or a long-term investment strategy will give you a clear and comprehensive property plan and what we call your game plan. So I'll talk a little bit about that later on, um, but I'll keep on keep on moving through. Um, this slide, guys, just uh, is something that we always put in our webinars and all of our conversational pieces around the fact that we are really proud of our uh, results to date. So I've been purchasing property for clients uh, since 2017. So there has been multiple, um, sort of multiple uh, cycles uh, throughout that particular period of time. Obviously, there was the APRA intervention in 2018. There was the potential of negatively negative gear being introduced. There was COVID. There was interest rate hikes. Uh, we've had a bit of everything. So um, over that period of time, on average, our clients have achieved about 13.6% growth year on year um, for investment properties, um, which is really great because that has been a quite a um, there has been quite a few ups and downs over that particular period of time. And I've been, has at, at times been hard to navigate, but it's really um, focusing on those key fundamentals of, of the right locations to be picking, but also um, purchasing the right assets that are going to underpin the value of that portfolio over a longer term. So enough about uh, me and milk chocolate. Um, I'm assuming uh, the majority of people here want to sort of understand what is happening in the Australian property market. Um, and it's a, it's a good time to have a chat about this because it is halfway through 2024 um, and this is essentially a bit of a um, state of around the ground so this chart highlights the Aussie residential property market across the key markets um, so as you can see most markets are heading north excluding Hobart um, and Darwin whilst Melbourne is is plateauing at this particular point in time I'll talk a little bit more about Melbourne shortly um, but essentially across the board, Australian home values have risen about 35% since COVID um, hit Australia back in March 2020. Uh, the market saw a strong cycle of growth through the pandemic and a short but sharp drop in values following the commencement of the rate hike. It made a full recovery in value by November 2023 and hitting fresh record highs every month since. Um, so the strongest performing markets, as you can see, uh, is Perth, Adelaide and Brisbane. Um, Generally, that means that they are coming off a lower base with a higher percentage growth increase, um, but also housing conditions and demographic trends are relatively weak over the years preceding the pandemic. Um, so the varied supply versus demand marks, differences in capital growth trends, um, and also the number of home purchases can most easily explain the different market speeds as well. So Perth, Adelaide and Brisbane, for instance, are the strongest performing markets due to their low supply of listings relative to sales and demand, but also likewise, um, their affordability. So when we're seeing interest rates increase, um, buyers' serviceability decreasing, they are now looking at opportunities in markets where they can afford to be purchasing properties. And at that point in time, back in 2022, those three markets, Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide, were relatively affordable for most buyers and investors looking to get into the property market in comparison to some of the other markets. Um, and so what are housing values increase? Why are sorry? Why are they increasing um, despite you know the recent interest rate rises? Um, and since the first rate hike in May 2022, national dwelling prices fell by by about 7.5 percent through to January 2023, which marked the lowest point of the downturn in housing values. But from the start of 2023, the cash rate also increased a further five times. But home values consistently rose, um, staging a recovery by not, uh, November 2023, which we which we just touched on. So. 
This is driven mainly by, as I touched on, low supply. So historical low supply in comparison to long-term averages relative to demand. Uh, as we know, the borders were closed, they reopened. A lot of demand came into the property market. Um, there's been tight labour market conditions. And also really importantly to note is just the accumulation of savings through the pandemic, um, which essentially broadly underpinned the mortgage serviceability, uh, mitigating a need to sell rate as rates have increased, but also the construction sector remains squeezed and unable to deliver a large backlog of dwellings. And strong population growth has increased the demand for housing for both purchases and rents. So essentially, as long as more people are willing to purchase a home than sell, then prices should theoretically continue to rise. The old supply versus demand still does stand the test of time. Uh, and then the composition of buyers may also be propping up purchases with high deposit sizes, indicating the current buyer profile may be less debt dependent than when interest rates were at record lows. Um, and also, as we touched on, um, just that serviceability issue, and that's such a driver at the moment, what we're seeing um, across the board, a lot of our clients looking to purchase investment properties. Historically, they're probably the average purchase price for our clients is about 750000 certainly getting a lot more interest around that six, sub $600,000, $550,000, mark, and it's based, purely based on the fact that that's the, the max amount that they can, that can service. So um, as Ben would have touched on, he would be seeing that as well based on what banks, how banks are servicing and viewing um, borrowing capacities at this particular point in time, and obviously interest rate hikes aren't helping the cause. So um, Sydney is probably the exception to the rule in this particular instance, given its average medium house price. Um, it is always generally, though, driven through owner-occupier-led market growth, uh, which is also supported by uh, the strongest household incomes nationally. So it's a bit of an around the ground about in, in terms of what's happening um, across Australia. In terms of regional activity, um, the level of competition has simmered for sure, and we've seen less demand going into those particular markets um, with a noticeable drift, um, most importantly on days on market. Um, so investors are entering the market and diluting the home owner pool, buying pool, um, although it's reasonable to suggest that the cities will likely outstrip regions in terms of demand. Uh, however, good properties are still selling well. And essentially what we see in this particular space is when, we, when we're purchasing outside of those major capital cities, and we, we do do that, we'll still like to focus on markets that are within a commutable distance by public transport to a major CBD. And the reason we like that is because they're still leveraging the major CBD, still leveraging that growth, uh, the infrastructure and population growth that goes into those major corridors. So examples of that would look like um, the Gold Coast, the Sunshine Coast, the Ipswich, Logan, for instance, up in Queensland, uh, the Central Coast, Newcastle, Wollongong, New South Wales, and also Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, um, down in Victoria. And so they're all markets that do perform relatively well. Um, we'll, we will try to avoid purchasing those markets that are a little bit more isolated and are more sort of siloed and focusing on their own economic drivers. Um, for us, that puts a little bit too much risk from a long-term investment profile. Um, so that's a bit of a, a run around the grounds in terms of what's happening. It's also really important, guys, just to understand what are the market drivers to monitor uh, for, for 2024 and also beyond. So as you can see on this particular um, chart on the left-hand side, there's an arrow pointing up uh, and then also an arrow pointing down. So understanding if we're seeing an increase, uh, increasing new housing supply, relaxed lending, population growth and evidence of potential rate reductions. Um, we're going to have an impact on what's going to happen in the market. So these are the key behaviours and trends that may influence market trends, both positive and negatively for the rest of the year and beyond. Um, on the ground, buyer demand seems generally skewed to more affordable markets. So with Perth now being one of the, the primary markets driving growth in capital cities. So in June, it was estimated that Perth actually accounted for about 32% um, of the 0.7 uplift in the CoreLogic's capital city home value index. So that's sizable in terms of the heavy lifting that Perth is doing um, still at this point in time over, and it's been sustained growth for about a two year period. But also Adelaide has also con contributed more to the, to the headline growth figure as well, sitting at around 14, 14%. So, and that is up from about 4.1% a year ago. So essentially, um, I suppose, what would another rate rise mean? I don't know, Ben touched on it in his piece as well. A um, little bit of uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen in August on the back of these the raising inflation rates. Another 25 basis point rate rise in the cash uh, rates in August um, it would probably take um, the average um, mortgage repayment up to about $4,000 per month. So not only is that further out of reach for prospective buyers, it would likely also represent a further blowout in the premium of holding a mortgage relative to renting. 
Um, and the bigger that that premium becomes, the weaker demand for purchases may become relative to renting, despite rent growth still sitting well above average. However, with rents still increasing due to limited supply, uh, increased population growth and a generalised cost of living crunch and potential inability to raise funds for a deposit, investors will see sustained increased rents, um, supporting um, high yields and lower vacancy rates. So for those that want to purchase and not rent, uh, if this is not affordable in regions they do like, and what we are seeing is that they're simply uprooting and moving into state if required and finding more affordable and sometimes superior lifestyle opportunities as well. Um, so this is obviously likely going to add more demand to other markets that are more affordable, providing strengthened price appreciation in those particular regions. So we certainly did see this um, coming off the back of COVID. Um, that was sometimes driven by lifestyle factors, um, which was pushing growth into, in particular, that southeast Queensland region. Um, but essentially, the moral of the story is take a macro approach to determine what is the best markets for your investment criteria. So focusing on the key residential, sorry, the key real estate fundamentals drivers for long-term sustained growth um, and also not to forget like the total residential market is worth about 10 10.5 trillion dollars and 8.4 trillion worth of equity and we do know there's about 271 billion offsetting um the 2.2 trillion in loan so the average sort of the the, the, the current ltv loan to value ratio at the moment in the australian property market sitting on only about 22 percent so there's certainly a bit of um funds available uh, in a lot of homes. Um, and essentially that talks to the next point with regards to intergenerational wealth transfer. And essentially what we're seeing from a lot of our clients that are signing up to our services, but also competition at auctions as well when we're competing for properties is that uh, we're purchasing properties that are sort of supported by the bank of mum and dad. So baby boomers, uh, that generation passing down the wealth to millennials and Gen Ys um, to help bridge the gap and get their children onto the property ladder um, for those who are struggling to raise funds to get a deposit and get onto the property market. So there is so many factors at play, guys, in terms of what is going to influence the market. And yes, interest rates is one factor, but as we've seen historically, um, it hasn't really affected the market because investors are still wanting to get into the property market, bricks and mortar, Aussie's live Boeing property. Um, and we're just now focusing on particular markets within, you know, within the, the Australian property market. So a lot of the, the major uh, mastheads are talking about the major capital cities and what's happening in those particular markets, but it's really important to also take a focus and, and, and take a micro lens to other markets and what they're currently doing as well, because it's really important to not put all your, your emphasis on those particular uh, marketplaces because they will generally sort of not be telling the full picture. So that's, I suppose, enough about the market and what, what we're seeing at the moment. Um, what we also just wanted to quickly talk about, I'm just aware of the time, so I'll try and move through the next part quite quickly. Um, we work with our clients um, to understand what is their game plan. So it's really, really important before you start the process of purchasing a property, um, as we've seen on today's webinar, understanding your financial position, understanding the tax implications of buying property whilst living abroad, and then also just determining what is your game plan that's tailored to your specific needs. So you've got lifestyle drivers, you've got financial drivers, um, but it's really important from our point of view, when we work with the clients, every client has a game plan. If it's if it's one property or 50 properties, we still really need to understand the economical drivers that's going to impact the location um, recommendations. What's the budget that we're going to be purchasing that property with? Is there a minimum yield that we need to be targeting? Um, all those sorts of things go into factoring what is the best location to be purchasing a property, but it comes back to what is your key drivers economically? Are you looking just to build equity in your portfolio? Are you looking to achieve passive income so you can retire in the future? Whatever that might be, it's really important to build out a game plan. And Milk Chocolate has a game plan product that we use for all of our clients looking to get into the property market. Um, and on the next slides, essentially, we have a product and a platform that helps make this process as simple and seamless as possible. So really understanding um, what your key drivers are. So for instance, it might be I've got $150,000 can put towards um, my property portfolio about $1,000 per month. And in 15 years time, I'd love to maximize my equity position or I'd love to achieve X amount of passive income so I can retire. Um, so we'll provide you with uh, multiple permutations and scenarios to help you understand different um, methods using property and the strategies within property to help you achieve your goals. So option one might be something that's light or conservative through to something that's a little bit more adventurous. Um, you'll be able to view um, those plans side by side, the timeline of events, understand the numbers. Um, and then once we go through that process, as I've touched on, that 
then filters into what is the right location to suit that economical brief. Uh, and then that gets served into the purchasing team who'll go off and execute the purchase based on the game plan. Following the purchase, I will have the ability to track your game plan. So really important to understand how your portfolio or property is performing against the forecast plan um, in real time. So understanding valuations, LBR positions, debt positions, et cetera. Um, so given we're just running out of time, guys, um, just quickly an example of a case study um, for a client who has taken up a game plan and we're working through um, the purchases for this particular client. Um, he came to us um, with a figure which was which is certainly more than most of our clients who come to us with, but 2.7 mil is working towards trying to achieve an $18,000 per month passive income by the year 2028. And he was working towards a 10 year time frame. Um, so obviously the game plan that we worked with him on was focusing on high yielding assets in particular commercial assets um, and adding buying residential assets and adding secondary dwellings. Um, so the first property that we purchased for this particular client was a commercial asset in Canberra for just under $600,000, it was achieving a 9.94 yield um, and also had a long-term lease in place of so five years plus a five-year option, which is obviously really strong and strengthens the asset um, for the long-term. Um, we're also looking at, sorry, jumped ahead, whoops. Um, the second commercial property was a uh, another asset purchased in Canberra uh, with a yield of 7.84%. Um, this particular um, asset has a three plus three year option on for our particular clients um, and a, a residential asset with the ability to add a granny flat. Um, so we purchased it for 700K. Um, we spent about 200K on the granny flat build. So went from a three bedroom residential asset to an additional two bedrooms, one bathroom, uh, on the rear dwelling, um, which is generating uh, rents of about $1,105 per week. Um, and then the final, um, well, sorry, the next purchase in this client's particular game plan was a, a commercial asset in Brisbane. Um, so this was recently purchased for this particular client at 1.65 mil and achieving a yield of 7.24% um, with a five plus five year option as well. So um, as you can see, very much driven towards passive income. It was just an example, just wanted to show you guys today, which is something a little bit different, um, but the game plans that we can produce are tailored to your particular needs. So if you're looking to generate equity, we can look at a more traditional residential buy and hold strategy as well. But this was just something a little bit different to take you guys through today. Um, so guys, we're remiss of me not to talk about our services and what we can do as it touched on. We have a full team um, focusing on data analytics and economics through to purchasing, design and project management if it's a renovation through to your traditional property management services. Um, we would like to offer a 10% discount um, if you were looking to um, engage a buyer's agent to start the process of building a portfolio or adding to your property portfolio. Um, so you could simply just scan the QR code that's on the screen, remembering that we will share this with you following the webinar and just using the code AUXPAT uh, when you start to onboard. Um, to receive the 10% discount on our investment property fee uh, or the family home fee. These are the steps that you need to take um, to register. So you simply just register, um, create a profile, tell us what you're looking to do, buy an investment property, buy the family home, and then working your way through the onboarding by telling us exactly what you're looking to do. And thereafter, we'll start the process by building out your game plan um, and working through the, the steps of purchasing that property and building your portfolio. Thank you guys. So I did rush through that at the end. I was just really conscious of time. We're, we're three minutes over. Um, but again, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I haven't double, I haven't checked in to see if there is any questions, which I will have a look. Looks like they're still focusing on the on the uh, on the tax questions. Um, so Darren and Brad's uh, I might yeah, just quickly just go through these. Yeah, yeah, I can see those, Richie. Thanks. Um, so yeah, good, good questions. Um, maybe um, Caroline, if you want to reach out, maybe for a quick chat on that one. There's probably a few issues we can go through to help you there, but it might be just easier to have a have a chat. So maybe reach out uh, via email. Yeah. Cool. Yep. All right, guys. If there's no more questions, I'm aware that we're over time. But um, thank you all very much for giving up your time on this Thursday. Um. We've both, we've all enjoyed, sorry, um, taking you through um, finance, tax and property uh, when you're looking at purchasing property in Australia. So again, we will share the, the webinar recording with you post this particular um, meeting and we'll also share the presentation decks that we've um, spoken about today. So you'll get all that information as well. So feel free to reach out uh, if you've got any further questions, but thanks again for your time. Thanks, everyone.
Yes, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much.